Hello, everyone. All right, so today we are going to walk you through unleashing some of the powerful AI automations using generative AI. Have you heard about generative AI? <laughs> Not a single day without generative AI, isn't it? So this session is all about how can you improve your productivity, gain some pro efficiency in your day-to-day -day life. So I'm Jitendra. I'm a solutions architect at AWS. Along with me, I have I go by Shri. I'm a solution architect as well here at AWS. And I'm Jer Marathi, a senior solutions architect with AWS. All right, so to get started, this is the agenda for today. First, we'll learn what are the typical productivity challenges we encounter, and then what are the opportunities with generative AI which can help us overcome those challenges? Um, what does a life of a data engineer and analyst look like on a day-to-day -day basis, and we can walk you through some of the generative AI stack, which will help us create those opportunities and convert those opportunities to gain some insights into enhancing our productivity. But this is not going to be all tech presentations, right? We have three good demos built out to you, uh, so there's going to be a lot of demos, less slides. Are you interested? Are you excited? All right, good to see some enthusiasm here. To start with, you know, the productivity challenge. Um, manual processes always hinder productivity. Is, is that a true statement? Right, so we often see that as a big challenge where we have a lot of manual processes which definitely affects our productivity. And then businesses seek ways to maximize output and efficiency. How many times we, the business comes up with new requirements or keep changing the requirements? Right? How do you adapt and gain some productivity to put your workflows into production? While doing that, you often get hit by some of resource constraints. Right? Resource constraint could be at the infrastructure level, or it could be with the resources which are available to work on building data pipelines, uh, and so on. So there could be a lot of constraints there, and on top of it, whatever team we are forming, we need to make sure that all the resources are skillful, be up to the speed to be developing all the data pipelines. And then we also have to navigate to unclear goals, unrealistic goals, navigating through that back and forth communication. So all of these are productivity challenges we encounter day to day, right? Now let's look at, you know, where are data engineers or analysts spending time when you're developing or working on Airflow, right? Uh, you first have to find an accurate technical guidance from relevant documentation, code generation, resources, and so on. So, and then based on the requirements you gather, you have to come up with a solid design, right? You spend considerable amount of time designing your workflow. It could be a new design, it could be updating, an existing design uh, for your data pipelines. And then you want to create, or you want to write your DAGs, you want to write code to develop the DAGs. Uh, before doing that, you want to make sure the infrastructure to deploy those DAGs, to test those DAGs are available. And then once it's done, once you have done developing, you want to test and make sure it's secure, right? While testing, you want to make sure you have enough and diverse unit test cases you have diverse data set uh, to test your pipeline. Uh, and top of that, while you're adding some code to it, you want to make sure there are no security vulnerabilities in the code uh, so that you know, any actors could exploit that. Um, and then we want to operate. You want to maintain and uh, you know, operate over iteratively uh, by continuously enhancing, um, optimizing the code, uh, making sure you're incorporating all the best practices on a day-to-day -day life, right? Um, once you deploy your DAG, um, you want to maintain and modernize your DAG uh, all the time. Uh, maintaining the DAG, you know, updating, um, and, and so on. So the most toughest thing is to upgrade, right? You all will are definitely get excited when a new Airflow version is released, right? Once a new version is released, how difficult it is to upgrade an entire environment where you have hundreds and thousands of DAGs running. You want to make sure 
you still want to leverage that, right? So these are some of the opportunities for us as a data engineers. We want to make sure we get most out of it. So let's look at what generative AI uh, brings us, right? Uh, opportunities, uh, you know, there's a survey by Gartner that more than 80% of the enterprise are going to adopt generative AI and generative AI enabled applications by 2026. So if you look at the opportunities here, uh, a McKenzie survey tells us that generative AI's ability to understand natural language processing is going to help us automate most of our work activities. And it's going to get us at least 25% efficiency. So if you're working eight hours a day, um, I hope you're working eight hours a day, but typically we don't, right? Um, but you should be able to save some, at least two hours if we get some AI companion helping us to accelerate our productivity. How do we get that, right? So if we get these two hours, how are we going to maximize our productivity by putting that two hours into something else which creates the most impact, okay? So these are the opportunities, you know, what we think is AI is going to drive the productivity gains. You know, if you have to create your infrastructure as a code, follow best practices, you want to be able to spin up an environment with a code which is available, spin it up, deploy your DAX, test it out for various activities. How can we uh, generate that um, infrastructure as a code real easy way? And then some, while developing DAX, there's a lot of boilerplate codes which we want to incorporate and you know, make sure that we are doing it at a faster speed. And then we have testing opportunities where we can automate and write some of the unit test cases, create documentation at scale, right? As a developers, we are, very, we are not very good in creating documentations, whether it's inline augmented with your code comments or creating a confluence page or writing a markdown document. Um, and then the most important thing is upgrading your Airflow versions, right? We want to continuously leverage new features, optimize the performance of our Airflow environment. So AI is going to drive productivity with all at every step what we do in a day-to-day -day life. To explore further, uh, Shri is going to help us walk us through some of the generative AI stack. Yep, thanks uh, Jitendra. So um, this is the generative AI stack within um, the uh, within AWS. So um, think of it like a three-layer um, structure. On the on the bottom layer is where we have all the infrastructure to build generative AI um, applications, right? Like all the silicon which is required, like from infrastructure standpoint. And then on the bo on the middle is where you have Amazon Bedrock, which is more of a platform using which you can build generative AI applications, um, right? And, and on the top layer is uh, Cube. Um, that's the focal point for our presentation today, where um, to basically integrate um, generative AI into your existing applications or create new applications right out of, right out of the box, right? And we'll be focusing on uh, the Amazon Q developer today. So what is Amazon Q developer? That's more or less a, uh, think of it like an uh, um, generative AI assistant. Uh, right, which you can incorporate readily into your applications, uh, into the entire SDLC, which uh, Jitendra was talking about, writing for, right from designing your uh, applications to, you know, kind of developing it, deploying it, and then, you know, from a maintainability standpoint as well, right? And a uh, good thing about this is, you know, security is already, and privacy is already baked into um, this particular uh, service over here. So that's what we'll be using uh, um, in in uh, in the in the demos as well today, right? So it will help you uh, right from you know from an airflow context to writing DAGs, testing it, optimizing it, and even upgrading, right? So this is the first uh, demo scenario which I wanted to talk about. So I've been talking to a lot of developers, even my myself, when I write DAGs, when there's a new version out there. I always wonder, right, I, I want to upgrade my DAG, but sometimes, you know, there's a lot of latency because, you know, like compatibility and few things I need to think about, right? And I, I also need to, like, go through a bunch of documentation to understand what are the latest and greatest features so that I can upgrade my DAG accordingly. So uh, what I want to do over here is take a legacy DAG and see if Generative AI can help me upgrade that DAG. 
So a couple of prerequisites, like what I do is like I have MWA local runner, uh, which I've set up that's basically to, you know, test out my, uh, uh, my DAGs um, before I actually deploy it into the, uh, uh, the, uh, the actual environment, right? So that I can like test them out if they're working out well. And then I also have product uh, provider packages uh, provided by Amazon so that, you know, I can like check the compatibility. So that's what I'm going to use to, you know, upgrade my DAG. So what I have over here, like, uh, all of, how many of you use Visual Studio for, uh, ah, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> so that's very apt, right? So, I mean, here we are showing Visual Studio, but you can use any other ID, like PyCharm or, or any other ID. So I have a legacy DAG out there uh, on the right-hand side of the panel. Uh, how I integrate Q is I go to the settings um, section over there, and there's an Amazon Q plugin available. Um, so you will go there and, you know, you'll set up that plugin. And we are using actually one of the new, newest features within that for this demo um, called the workspace index. So what this ideally does when you check that is whatever local files which you have open, it will pass this that as a context um, to the LLM, right? Whenever we ask a question or ask it to do certain task, it will index that file and basically, you know, sorry, it will send that file, index it and, you know, provide the response to us. So here, uh, this is my legacy DAG, um, you know, like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of lines over there. Um, you know, I don't want either, I know that legacy DAG or maybe I'm new to the organization, I completely do not understand it. Um, then I, as I mentioned, you know, I have the local runner set up over here and I also have the provider packages uh, which are um, set up over here. So uh, with that, uh, like, so, so as I mentioned, you know, I have the local runner. Now what, what I want to do is I want to go to my queue um, and then type in over there, right? I have a bunch of prompts which I'll be running. First thing is I want to understand in less than maybe 100 words what this DAG is actually doing, um, right? So that's my first prompt which I want to enter. Um, so I open a notepad. So can you explain me in less than 100 words what that lazy DAG.py is doing, right? So let's see what uh, um, the LLM responds. So within less than 100 words, what... Uh, 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 Q would be sending us as a response is, um, this is an Apache Airflow DAG, which uh, is using Amazon ERM, EMR, which is a um, you know data processing service within um, AWS. Um, and it talks about, you know, it, it is creating an EMR cluster, um, right? And then uh, it also is use, using like EMR ad step operator, like a couple of operator and sensors, right? So it, in less than 100 words, without even me reading like each and every line, it tells me uh, a high level summary of what it does, right? Now I want to ask, um, does the legacy DAG need an upgrade? So what it does is in the legacy DAG, so I got a Boolean answer, right? So I, I was expecting a Boolean answer. Uh, does it need an upgrade? And it says me, yes, uh, you're running a legacy DAG and you will need to upgrade it to Airflow 2.9.2 uh, with the provider pa package 8.2.7, right? And it also tells me that here are the key areas which you need to address, like differable operators, error handling, uh, task flow, right? But I know it shows some references from where it picked up. But I mean, this is okay, right? It, it's still theoretical. But I actually want the code. I want it to write the code for me, the Python code. Uh, I really, like I want an upgraded DAC um, or with, the, with the code, right? So I pass some additional uh, you know, details to it and I ask it like, you know, can you help me update the legacy DAC.py um, so that it uses EMR operators along with provider packages and also um, you know, some additional details, right? So um, while it's generating the response, so what it's doing over here is we are expecting it to like give me like, so it provides you like the entire code, right? right from your import statements um, to, you know, um, the various default arguments which I wanted to pass, then um, the DAG structure, right? Along with different functions which I want to utilize, um, right? Um, so how cool is that, right? Like then basically, you know, it's not like you'll just use it as is, but at least you have some boilerplate uh, code to get started, right? Instead of you writing um, each and every line over here, um, right? Uh, and once uh, once you have done that, like, you know, it also gives you the key changes which it has made. It tells that, you know, it has upgraded the import statements. Um, um, it, um, you know, replaced certain operators over there. Um, then, you know, it simplified some of the branching logic over there. Uh, but having said that, it still asks us to actually test this out before you can, uh, uh, before you can actually utilize it, um, right? So this is the main, like, the upgrade or the crux of the demo. But 
even after that, assume like, you know, I run this particular DAG um, in my environment and then maybe I run into a certain issue. So let's look at that scenario, right? Maybe I ran that DAG, then I, I got into an issue where I'm not able to, um, you know, it, it throws an error saying that it's not able to find a certain module, um, right? In this case, you know, no, no name, no module named um, EMR or something like that, right? So let's see what it says, right? So in this case, I expect it to actually pinpoint uh, why I'm getting this error um, and you know what, how I can address that particular error. So as you find here, um, you know, he tells me how to fix that error actually, right? Like tells me you're getting this error because you're mis missing certain package, um, right? And then, you know, this is what you need to do in order to address this uh, issue. So it's more from a debugging or a, or a troubleshooting standpoint, um, uh, what you can do. Uh, over here, right? So, and it also gives you the different references from where it picked it up from um, and all that stuff. So, I mean, all this is good, right? I mean, like, we are able to upgrade. Uh, we are, first of all, we are able to document what the DAG was doing. Now, I want to, like, basically get to the next level. Say, I want it, I want it to, like, um, um, explain me, like, from a best practices standpoint, right? One way, I can incorporate best practices by reading a lot of bunch of documentation out there and then incorporating in my DAG. How about we ask the LLM itself, like, you know, uh, can you incorporate best practices um, um, into my DAG, right? So, so again, you know, uh, let's see what it does, right? In this case, we are again passing the same modified legacy DAG.py um, and then, you know, asking, like, uh, make sure if all the best practices are implemented. So again, it provides me uh, various details on what all it does, it says, you know, I'm utilizing Taskflow dot, uh, uh, Taskflow API, um, XCOM push, and then, you know, uh, differable operators, I changed uh, uh, some of the differable, like I'm using for long running jobs, um, consider using differable operators, um, uh, right? So it basically identified what, what are the areas where you can incorporate best practices, including the list of um, what, and implementing these will basically maintain, make them uh, maintainability, readability, um, uh, and robustness of the DAG, right? So, so on and so forth, right? So basically, you know, that's another productivity improvement which you have seen, right? So, so on and so forth, right? Like, like I mean, last two are like uh, similar ones, but more of, more from a, you know, debugging standpoint. So yeah, so this is like the end-to-end -end life cycle as to how you can use Q to, you know, upgrade your DAGs um, uh, from productivity standpoint, right? Um, so yeah, like since we have a lot of content to cover, what we'll do is I know a lot of questions would have been popping up on your mind. Uh, we'll definitely you know, address this uh, as soon as we finish the content. Now I'll pass it over to Joe, uh, who would present the next uh, section on you know, code uh, uh, cloud formation. Awesome, thank you, Sri. So uh, in the areas that Jenny and I can help optimize your productivity, we talked about two other areas for example, creating infrastructure as code, and then actually doing your data engineer job, creating DAGs. So uh, we're gonna show you a demo of both of those scenarios and how we're gonna utilize Q to help with those opportunities. So just wanna level set, uh, we're obviously gonna use AWS services for this demo, hence the shirt. Um, but for the folks that aren't familiar with these services, so AWS does have a managed version of Apache Airflow, which is MWA. And we are also going to utilize our serverless data integration engine called AWS Glue. So think about that as a way to you know, deploy out Spark code on serverless compute. But all of these examples will go across all the different scenarios. So if you're using Terraform for your infrastructure's code, the same thing stays put. You're still gonna be able to interact with the generative AI assistant, follow best practices, et cetera. Maybe you're not use, utilizing Glue, you're utilizing another cloud service or maybe another you know, ISV partner for some of your ETL work. So just wanted to level set all of the services that I'm gonna be talking about and I'm gonna try to keep it as broad as possible. So we're gonna actually build out infrastructure and build out a DAG utilizing Amazon Q. So just to level set on what our scenario is gonna be within our DAG, it's gonna be a bread and butter uh, ETL scenario where we have an S3 bucket, think about that as just object storage. As new files land in there, we obviously wanna see, you know, has any of that metadata changed, add that to our data catalog, and then run our ETL tasks. And all of that is being orchestrated by MWA. All right, so let's build out our infrastructure. So 
there are multiple ways that you can interact with Q, both through a chat and also in line that I'm gonna show you later on. So in this case, we're just gonna start off with chatting with Q. So in this case, I'm gonna say, hey, generate me a CloudFormation template. This could also be, hey, generate me some Terraform modules, et cetera. And I'm saying that I want uh, it to be a small MWA deployment. I'm being explicit where I'm saying make sure you know all the properties are conformant. So with LLMs, you always wanna be more uh, discreet or more uh, straightforward with what you're trying to get. So obviously the LLM knows what to do properly. And you're seeing that I'm saying, hey, make sure I have all the necessary components to run an MWA environment, follow a specific naming convention, and then also I want a particular parameter, in this case an S3 bucket. So I put all of that in the chat, and Q's going to give me an overview of how it understood my question. It's then going to actually generate the code on the left side of the screen as a YAML file. And you see it's being streamed in, so I'm able to review it as it's going through. So you see it's creating you know, some CloudWatch log groups. It's gonna create our MWA environment. It's gonna set up a basic execution role, so our MWA environment is actually able to interact with different services. And then you see that it kind of gives an overview of, okay, what did I add to this CloudFormation template? And also, some sources of where it might have gotten inspiration for these types of uh, uh, resources. So you'll see here, I can just put in insert into, uh, into my ID and it will bring over that entire YAML file into there. So with generative AI created code, it's just gonna work right out of the bat, right? Like we're just gonna push to prod? No, so in this case, I'm going to run a library called CFN Lint, and this is basically a linter for YAML or JSON files within CloudFormation to make sure they're in uh, conformant to the syntax. So you'll see here, I got a couple different errors. It's telling me uh, log enabled was unexpected. Uh, did I mean enabled? So in this case, I'm going to ask Q, and I'm going to say, hey, I ran CFN Lint, I got these particular errors, can you help me fix this? So Q will do its thinking. It will give me an overview of the error and what that actually means. So in this case, it was improper syntax. And then it's going to fix that for me. So you'll see here that under those like web server logs and the worker logs that that log enabled property was changed to enabled. So now when I'm able to insert it back into my YAML file, and then I save it and I'm able to run a CFN lint again. Hey, no errors this time, at least for the syntax wise. So now I'm gonna say, okay, uh, the CFN lint is passing now, but I want to make uh, my MWA environment uh, more secure. So you know, I've got this kind of bread and butter YAML file that we've got here and I wanna make sure that we're following least privilege from you know, a security standpoint. So I'm gonna say any suggestions that you have for this particular template. So Q is gonna do its thinking and then it's going to give me an output of all the different recommendations that I could change within my YAML file to make it more secure and align with security best practices. So it's gonna give me a wide variety of different recommendations, You know, making sure that my security groups are thinking about those as firewall rules, are set up only so certain IPs can hit our MWA environment. But some of these recommendations might be handled by like a platform team, for example. Like it might be inherent within our environment that different tertiary services are enabled. I don't have to do that within my YAML file. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna see all the different things that it recommended for my file. And I'm gonna explicitly tell Q, hey, for these particular recommendations, I don't have to include this in my YAML file. This is handled by my you know, platform engineering team, or hey, this is inherent whenever I deploy into my company's environment. So I'm gonna say, hey, we've already got config and CloudTrail already enabled, so remove it. So Q is going to go through and it's going to generate me a new YAML file. And you see that it kept all of the other recommendations, like the trusted IP range as a parameter that then got moved down to that security group. It's going to keep all the networking, et cetera, the MWA resource, and now I have my new uh, template. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna see, okay, I'm gonna insert it, I'm gonna save it, and okay, push to prod. Oh, it actually had no errors, surprisingly. So, 
So now that was an example of uh, creating infrastructure as code. But as data engineers, we're going to spend a lot of time building out DAG files. So we can use inline comments to generate code line by line. So for example here, I'm going to put a comment that says import the necessary Airflow uh, provider libraries for an Apache Airflow DAG file. I'm going to say the particular provider is Amazon. And I'm going to be explicit. I'm going to say, you know, I want the S3 sensor, I want the glue crawler operator, and I want the glue job operator. So what you'll see is line by line, Q is going to make the recommendations. And I have the choice of whether I want to add that to my code or I can skip over it. So you see here it's brought in like the S3 sensor, the glue crawler operator, and also the glue job operator. All right, so now I'm going to say, all right, I need some param uh, variables within my DAG file. So in this case, I need an S3 bucket name, and I need a glue ARN. So you see here, it created the bucket variable. It obviously didn't fill it in, just a bunch of Xs, so I'll have to go back and edit that or parameterize that, but it gives me a nice baseline uh, to start off with. So now I'm going to create my default arguments that I want to include with my DAG file. And I'm going to say things like the owner is uh, airflow. I'm going to say what I want the start time to be, what I want the retries to be, whether I want to be notified. And just like before, it's going to make recommendations line by line. So you see uh, it gave me the entire argument. And I'm going to have to go through and make some changes. And I'm probably going to have to validate some of the syntax, you know, by maybe using the Q chat. But we're getting those productivity gains because I'm not having to go to documentation, look at something. I'm only going to have to do that if something is wrong. All right, now I'm going to say I want to import a DAG config file, and I want to reference the above arguments. So this is important because with Q, it understands the entire context of what I've written already. So I'm referencing, hey, I want those default arguments that are right above this. And you see I was able to put in what I want my schedule to be, what I want my timeout to be, et cetera. All right, so now we're going to dive into a specific sensor. So in this case, it will be the S3 sensor. And I'm going to say, hey, I want the bucket name to be that variable that I put above within my DAG file. And then I'm going to give it an explicit bucket key. So in this case, it's, I just made up one raw data blue. And you'll see that, OK, the S3 sensor filled out. Obviously, the tax, we don't want the task ID to be XXX, but I'm going to go through and I'm just going to change that. And then I can validate everything looks good. And then I'll move on to my next operator. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jitendra, who's going to cover uh, documentation. So uh, how do you take a DAG? You're a new person. How do you understand it? So if you look at it, you know, you have hundreds of lines of code. You're new to the team. How do I understand the business logic, right? You can leverage any LLM or your coding companion to walk us through, explain what this DAG does, right? Um, this is a simple DAG which uh, gets a file from the S3, use Pandas library to do some filter aggregation, remove columns, et cetera. But I want to really understand, you know, it's very simple is to, rather than browsing through hundreds of lines of code, you can ask a coding companion like Q um, or GitHub uh, to be able to explain what this DAG does. This makes life really easy. Um, and it's just not the entire DAG. If you would like to stress or focus on a particular snippet of the code just to reduce the scope, all you could do is go to a section, um, select the sec section here, pass that as a context to your coding companion, um, like I do here, right click, Q, send it to the prompt, and ask to explain this snippet in detail. Right. So yeah, doesn't matter if you're new to the team, it's really easy to understand um, what you're writing, right? What the code has, what is the code and how, where, how and where can you modify? If you look at this, this gives line by line explanation of every single uh, snippet, what we have, what it does, right? If you look at it, um, this is how it streams, how it converts, group by. Um, if you're not aware of any particular syntax, this is the perfect opportunity for us to understand what it does by looking at it. This is one way of kind of helping 
ourselves into getting into a new territory. If you look at it, um, it also gives me line by line. And then uh, in the end, it gives a summary and some set of recommendations here that what should be the next question or what should be the next you want to explore based on our past interactions. So it's smart enough to provide us with those recommendations as well. Next is generating code documentation, right? As, as a developer, as a data engineer, we often tend to miss generating documents. So uh, how, do you, how do I generate document at scale, right? We want to be a good developer. We want to make sure that we have sufficient inline code comments. So that's why we can select a snippet and then pass it as a context. And in the prompt, you can ask that, OK, give me some code comments. Uh, it accurately generates the code comments for you, line by line. Um, if you look at it, it gives you uh, the hash. And then if you look at it, drop unnecessary columns from the data frame. It understands it's a DF, is a data frame uh, in the context. And then you're renaming it, you're grouping it, you're filtering it, um, you know, um, replacing all the NA values in the data frame, or you're actually calculating the sum of confirmed deaths. This is a data set of COVID uh, thing. You can generate the documentation for the entire workflow as well. Imagine you have hundreds of lines of codes and you want to generate a documentation and inline comments as well. So pass that the entire file as a context and then generate a documentation for it. Um, so it's going to generate the documentation uh, at every single uh, statement here, right from importing necessary modules, your, it understands you're declaring a Apache Airflow variables. Uh, so it says that, okay, the a, you know, get um, the S3 bucket name, input file key, output, and every single line of your business logic has an appropriate inline comment augmented. How easy it is to generate documentations at scale. Imagine you have uh, just not one DAX of hundreds of lines, but if you have hundreds and thousands of DAC files where you want to document everything as well. Um, the next idea what we uh, came up with is generating uh, documentation like a markdown files, or maybe uh, writing a documentation for your Confluence page where you want to document your entire data pipeline. Uh, in this way, you can just give a prompt asking uh, the code where you want to save this as a markdown file, and please generate me a markdown file for my data pipeline. Um, so it's going to help us generate this beautiful pipe, uh, markdown file with a really impactful and meaningful headers, um, which again displays everything out here. So if we save this as a markdown file, you can generate this really easily at scale. So these are some of the ideas we wanted to walk you through and take away how generative AI can help us accelerate our productivity. Next, uh, what are the, some of the cons considerations, right? As you're embracing AI, uh, what's the future with Airflow? What, what are the, some of the considerations you should be looking for, right? One is what are the key benefits you're getting out for your productivity from this AI, right? Always measure impact. If I'm working on a use case, let's say you know, creating infrastructure as a code takes me three days, it could be cloud formation, it could be Terraform, any choice of your framework. How much time is it taking and how much impact AI is going to help us drive in saving those man hours? Always quantify your impact, measure the impact and work on it, which makes the most sense, right? Security. A uh, lot of organizations today have uh, you know, concerns around security. Is the coding companion using my source code to train the underneath models, making sure that your coding companion is secure, right? When you're writing a code or it, the code is already written, how can AI coding companion like Q help you to uh, evaluate or run through the security vulnerabilities that uh, you're making sure that you do not have any vulnerabilities in it? Um, and then whatever the code is generated, you always have human in loop to review and uh, test the generated code. Um, the important Factor again here is a lot of you work in organizations which have high standards, uh, coding practices, uh, reusable libraries. How do we make sure a coding companion gives us a recommendation of not a brand new code, but making sure that 
We are reusing our library, reusing our code, which is already there. Um, so our coding companion, like Q, is able to give you a custom code recommendation. So that's something you need to consider.